probably shoot off afterwards. I'm going to pop down and see Ralph. It's one of the brothers of, of Phil who passed away uh, yesterday or Friday, actually. Well, we're going to consider again, we're thinking about this idea of, of the invite, of coming, of following, and so forth. And um, there's this call by Jesus to come and to follow. It was a call that we're going to look at this morning, but actually it's the same call that's gone throughout the generations. The, the same call is there, come to Jesus and follow him. If you remember in John chapter 20 and verse 31, the apostle there writes these words. He says, these things were written that you may believe Jesus Christ is the son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name. So why was John's gospel written? It was written so we may know about Jesus Christ and we may put our faith in him. We may believe that Jesus was the Son of God. He'll explain to us that Jesus was the Redeemer who came into the world to purchase a people for himself. And there it is that we should therefore respond and put our trust in him. If we wish to gain eternal life, this is the avenue, only through Jesus Christ. So if you've got a, a friend who... You're not sure if they really know much about the Christian message. They don't know much about the things of God. Well, I'd advise you to give them, tell them to read John's Gospel. Or read Mark's Gospel. Read John's Gospel. Because in John's Gospel, it'll explain who Jesus was and why he came quite clearly. And you'll have that, that story, that narrative going all the way through that particular book. They should, by God's grace, come to the conclusion that Jesus is the Son of God. Now... What we'd have to say is this, that followers that are normally called to follow Jesus Christ are ordinary people. That's our first point. Those who are called to follow Jesus Christ are normally ordinary people. Then we're going to see there's a need for us, therefore, if we follow Christ, to encourage others to come and follow him. That's really what the gospel is about. That's what the Christian message is about. Now, John the Baptist has been preaching, had been drawing crowds out into the, into the wilderness, they, they come in, in hordes to listen to John, this great prophet, they thought. And when he comes, he declares them the Lamb of God was going to come and take away the sin of the world. Now the Jews were waiting for a king, they were waiting for the Messiah. But they actually got a lamb, didn't they? It wasn't really, they hadn't really got their head around the fact. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, was to be the Lamb of God. So this word that was going to be preached and this offer that's going to be made... It was going to be made to ordinary people, not many wise, not many mighty, there are not many noble who are called. Actually, God has called the foolish things, the foolish people, if you want, of this world to confound the mighty. So what we say this morning is there's hope for all of us, because there's not many mighty here this morning, there's not many great or noble here this morning. So the majority of the group that followed Jesus were just ordinary people. In fact, most of them, the majority of the disciples, were actually fishermen. Ordinary, simple, working class folks. Jesus calls ordinary people to follow him. That's why we say we can encourage anyone to put their faith in Jesus Christ. If they're intelligent, if they're not, if they can read, if they can't write, if they whatever it is, if they put their faith in Jesus Christ, whether they're a native out in the jungle or whether they're the scholars in the university, we can say God calls all different types. But normally, it's ordinary people. So we have the first group here in this opening section of John's Gospel of those that were called to follow Jesus. The first five, if you want, which will include John, who doesn't mention himself, but he never mentions himself at all when he writes the Gospel. But John is there. He's recording these events. He was actually there in, in, in the vicinity. So we're thinking about the first five that, that, were, that were there. John is not the John the Baptist we just mentioned. John is the Apostle John. And he's recording these, these events, never refers to himself. So we're going to think about those, those first um, four that were called. There was Andrew, there was Peter, there'll be Philip, there'll be Nathaniel or Bartholomew. Now when you read the opening chapter of chapter one in John's Gospel there, what you'll find is it's it actually goes through a sequence of days. So the first day, we find that John the Baptist is speaking about the need, the Messiah is coming, he's coming, he's preparing the way for the Messiah to come. The next day, 
we find that John the Baptist says, Jesus is the Son of God. But he's also the Lamb of God who's coming now, look, and he's come to take away the sin of the world. Then we get to day three. And what happens in day three from verse 35 on, we have the followers of John the Baptist, these men we've just mentioned, they were now to leave John and to follow Jesus. So we find that John the Baptist has declared the Lamb of God. Has come, he's actually declared it twice. This is the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sin of the world. They've been waiting for the Messiah. So in verse 37 to verse 38 there, John the Baptist, he now knows his disciples, and I need to take my jacket off, it's a bit warm. His, his disciples are actually now going to become the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what was going to happen. They were going to become the disciples of Jesus himself. One of the dangers in the church, one of the dangers, I don't think it's a major problem here, but one of the dangers in the, in the church, especially a bigger church, is that we can follow a man. We can be actually, you know, captivated by a particular man. So some of the, the, the big ministries... I mean, in, in, day, in days gone by, Dr. Martin, who everybody holds in high esteem, and, and was a, a great preacher of, of, of the last century. But actually, even some of the men, they, they, I, I just sticks in my mind, I go into, a, into, into the study of a man who was well known, and there was a picture of Dr. Martin on his, on his, on his, um, in his library. And, and there was a danger, wasn't there, that people can be caught up with a man and follow a man. In America, it's a major problem because they've got mega churches. And these men have such a high profile that they actually end up that people almost follow the man. And when something happens, which has happened recently, some of the great men have fallen and it's, it sends shockwaves through the church because people have been following a man. I don't want people to follow me. In fact, I'm at the end of my, my, my journey, aren't I? So I don't want people to follow me. What I want people to do is, is follow my saviour. That's, that's what I want them to do. I don't want people here to say we want to be following Norman Gilbert. It's the Lord of glory that we want people to follow. So the disciples who were following John were now going to follow Jesus. We find that Andrew, that's Simon Peter's brother, when he listened to John the Baptist preaching and speaking, and then he recognizes this is Jesus who's coming as the Lamb of God. When the declaration is, is made, here we find this man decides now to follow Jesus. What John does, he's recording all these events. He's very precise in all the details that he, he writes down. And because we find in verse 39, he doesn't only tell us this is the, the, the third day. He tells us it was actually the 10th hour of that day. So he's writing all the details. John is there and he's able to record these in details. So in verse 38, as they follow Jesus, he turns around and he asks to, to Andrew, who are you seeking? What do you want from me, he says. Now they follow John the Baptist, they follow his teaching, and they had now come to realize, or he had come to realize, that this was indeed the one who come, the Lamb, who was going to be the final sacrifice for sin. This was the Lamb of God who was promised to take away the sin of the world. Andrew had begun to understand that. John was there also at this time, I believe. And what he wanted to do, and we're going to sing about that shortly, he wanted to know more about Jesus. Now, there's many things we need to know regarding the Christian faith. There's many things about the Christian doctrine and teaching. But what we need to know, we need to know more and more about Jesus. And we need to know more about him in our own lives and in our own experience. So he comes. He calls him rabbi. He, the word was an idea behind the, the word is the, the idea of a student speaking to a teacher. And so he calls him rabbi. He asks, where are you staying in verse 38? Verse 39, Jesus says, come and see. Come and have a look where I am. And John and him, they, they, they followed. They came near to where he lodged. So they went and they stayed with him. They stayed with him for some hours. Listened to him. Took note of what he had to say. They'd sought out Jesus. They found him. They followed him. And now they were sitting at his feet probably and listening to this great teacher. The wonderful thing we can say to people is this, that if we seek Jesus, we will find him. There's no ambiguity, there's no, there's no possibility, maybe, maybe. If we are truly seeking him in our hearts, we will find Jesus. We will come to know him for ourselves. 
It's interesting, Jesus says, well, come and see what I am. And then he talks to them, he speaks to them. It seems like he doesn't seek an immediate response from them. He'd spent his hours with them, with them. In the days to come, he was going to spend days with them. In fact, he was going to spend three years teaching them and speaking to them and encouraging them. And Jesus was gradually presenting the great truths to them. You see, God deals with people in different ways. But Jesus isn't in a rush here. Now, I've mentioned Billy Graham many times. I got a great respect for Billy Graham. I've got to say that. Whenever I've heard him, I've heard him many times. Whenever I've heard him, what he had to say was worth listening to. What I had difficulties with Billy Graham was the, the concept behind his campaigns. And one of the ideas was you had to get a response from people there and then. So you had the big altar call, didn't you? And they came down in thousands, in droves, or hundreds probably. And they wanted an immediate response, and you'd sign the card, or whatever you do, hand up, and so forth. And yet God moves in people's lives in, in different ways. There are people who you can speak to who come to faith in Jesus Christ. And they've had a dramatic conversion. And we can only think of the Apostle Paul. What a conversion. What an experience he had. On the road to Damascus, there he finds he, he, he's met with the risen Lord. But paths are different. We come to Jesus in different ways. But the entrance is the same. There's many roads lead there. But actually the entrance is the, is the same. There's only one door. And that door is Jesus Christ himself. There's only one way to be accepted by God. That's by putting our faith in Jesus. To deal with our sins once and for all. To understand. And this is what Jesus would have been explaining to them. To understand he was the Lamb of God. Who would make atonement once and for all for sin. And this is what these men came to realize. John the Baptist had prepared the way. He'd set forth the work of, of, of what Jesus was going to do. He spoke about the fact that he's come to take away the sin of the world. And having heard John speak for some time, he spoke about repentance. And repentance is a vital ingredient in the, in the gospel. Repentance simply means we don't go the way we used to go. There's a change takes place. We don't follow the same track that we always walk down. We come to faith and we've turned around and we're going to follow Jesus and not the old way. So they'd heard about him, they were waiting for him and now they were, they were following him. They'd understood that he came to take away their sin. So he declared Jesus, Jesus declared these truths to him, I should say, to them. And when we speak to people, we, we've got no idea how God will deal with them. God does deal with people in different, day, or different ways. What we have to say is, today is the day of salvation. So that would have been Billy Graham's sort of driving motive, I would have thought, was if they don't respond today, they may not be here tomorrow. And you can understand that mindset. We also believe that God is sovereign and he's in control. But today is only ours. There's only ours today. We haven't got tomorrow. I listened the other morning, I was up early, I listened to the, an interview to, by, by an interviewee who was talking to Sir Chris Hoy, the cyclist who, who won all the gold medals. He's been diagnosed at the age of, I think it's 47, with, with stage four cancer. He had um, um, gallbladder <coughs> cancer, it's gone into the bones. He knows that his time is limited. And if ever you looked at a man that looked fit, he was strong, powerful, the man knows his time is limited. Now he knows that. He's got that time ahead of him. But he knows ultimately his end. We don't know that. So we tell people. And we tell them to respond. And we, we pray that they will. And here we find this man, Andrew, and I believe John. They come to realise this. So thankfully, two ordinary fishermen listening to John the Baptist, understanding repentance... And then hearing that Jesus is the one now who deals with this sin, they're going to follow Jesus. And Jesus is going to spend time. He's not just spending those hours, not the following days. He's going to spend three years explaining to them how and why he came. So, thankfully, ordinary people can come to faith in following Jesus Christ. But also we can see the need to encourage others to come. We're to seek Others to come and follow him. We're to encourage others. We're to spread the word of God. We're to encourage people to put their faith in Jesus Christ. What, what is faith? Well, 
You see, faith isn't just kind of, oh, I just trust and believe there's a God. You know, faith comes by hearing. We have to understand what is needed to come to faith. That's why we teach the gospel. That's why we preach the word of God. Because we have to explain to people what the, the, the requirements are. They need to repent of their sins. They need to believe Jesus died for their sins. They need to put their trust in him and they need to follow him. So there's, there has to be hearing with faith. We don't say to people, you know, don't even know, just believe there's a God. That's, that's not faith. We tell people there's a need to trust, to put your total rest and confidence in him. And then we say there's a need to speak. We're to confess what we know. John um, Romans chapter 10 tells us. We, we believe in our hearts, but we confess with our mouths. So there's no such thing as a, as a secret disciple. We have to explain that we have to say to people that we are Christians. We do follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have to hear, we have to trust, we have to speak, tell people, but we also have to show. So you see, where we, have, where we break down is this. We talk about love, we talk about forgiveness, we talk about compassion, we talk about sensitivity, and then as we heard the other week, we don't guard our mouths. We open our mouths and we make, put our foot straight in it. And really what happens is, you see, we're not ready to speak, we are to show in our lives that God transforms people's lives, their thinking, their attitude, even the way they speak and what they do. So these were told to come and see, to follow. And what, what we find is that they're encouraged or going to encourage others to follow. It's what, what evangelism is, isn't it? It's going out spreading the good news. We're not to be afraid to speak. We're not to be afraid to show. We have to say in our culture now, anything that speaks of radicalization or fundamentalism or anything like that, immediately the, 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 the warning lights go on. Because you're not supposed to be fanatical about anything. You're not supposed to be radical or, or, or to be those who, who, who have a different view. And so in our climate, we're supposed to be in free speech. I say it very often. This is not a country of free speech. You cannot get up and say certain things that you don't agree with on the, on the authority of God's word. Why? Because you'd be in deep water. And they tell our universities now, you must you know, watch out now with this freedom in debates in, in university because people will get up and voice opinions and views which are not with the status quo if you want. We're not to be afraid to speak. We're not to be afraid to show that we are Christians. We're not to be afraid to stand up and to be counted. And throughout history, that's been the message of the gospel. People have stood up and spread the news, even when such an attitude has been condemned by those in authority. If you were a, a Christian in the days of the Roman Empire, in those days of Nero and so forth, you would have been a brave person to stand up and speak and show, wouldn't you? But that was what the Christians did. And that was how the gospel spread. Going back, probably still today, but certainly going back a couple of decades... In, in certain communist countries, you were in deep water if you said you believed in God or you were a Christian. If you were to say that in certain Islamic countries now, you would be in trouble. You, would, you wouldn't be accepted. And so we, we ought to be those in, in, in the, the day in which we live, we're willing to stand up and, and to be counted. And that's not easy. Do we share what we believe? Do we confess before people what we believe? Do we actually do what Andrew did? And encourage others to come to faith. When is the last time we told someone we're a Christian and we believe in Jesus? When is the last time we actually said to someone, why do you come to church with me? Why do you come to a service? Why do you come to the ladies? Why do you come? When is the last time we actually said that or did that? Andrew does it. He says, he calls his brother to come and to listen to what he's heard and what he, what he, what he knew of Jesus. We ought to be those who, who share what we've got, to go tell others to come. The author, he doesn't speak about himself, as I said, but he's one of the two that has gone to hear Jesus. Now they're going to get another one to come and follow. Andrew's reaction in verse 41 is really that he's shown, that's been shown by the church over the years. They want other people to hear the good news of the gospel, to hear about the Saviour. How can they hear without a preacher? How will they hear if they don't come in the vicinity of a preacher or of the word of God? Where does it begin? Well, Andrew starts at home. Tells his brother, Peter. Peter's the one he tells first about 
the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we believe the Bible, if we believe there is a heaven, if we believe there is a hell, if we believe that there's eternal judgment upon those who will not put their faith in Christ, well, we'd start at home and we'd, try, we'd have our loved ones. We'd try to get them under the word of God. We'd try to bring them to hear the things of God, to tell them about Jesus Christ. Why? Because we know what's before them. We know there is an eternal judgment awaiting. So, charity begins at home. The witnessing of the gospel begins at home. Preaching is vital. The, the good news has to be spread. But often it begins with personal witness, with friendship, within a family, within colleagues in work. It starts by not only speaking, which we're very good at sometimes, and others can't do it very well, but sometimes it begins with just showing that we are those who follow Jesus. He was delighted to bring his brother along. Now, over my years in, in here, I, I can't say I've seen great things in 30 years here. Yeah. One of the big encouragements I had in my early, well, many years ago now, was when my mother died, my father started attending the church. He came here for, I don't know, how many years. And father was a hard man in his time, believe me. But he came here, and he came here for many years, and I believe in the end he came to faith. Uh, that would be one of the big encouragements, isn't it? We see our children coming to church. We see our grandchildren coming to church, at least coming under the sign of the gospel. That's what encourages our hearts, isn't it? To think that at least the starting at home, we're getting some kind of response. At least they're having an opportunity, or they've had an opportunity. If Andrew had never told Peter, what would have been the outcome for the Christian church? Because this man was going to become a leader in the early church. You read the first 12 chapters of Acts, who's the prominent one? It's Peter who's the one who's prominent. If he'd never have brought Andrew, Andrew never brought Peter, I should say, to Jesus, what would have been the outcome? We're thankful for those who encouraged us over the years. Um, I probably said before, but when I was a kid in the village, Stuart Ollie came, did his bit in the village with the students and what I really did. I must have been about 10 or 11. Years later, he sent me a letter, and I never had a letter in my life, from a minister in, in, in London. And he says to me, there's a couple of coming to the church down in the mission there. I think you should go along. They got a youth group started up, Mrs. P and, and her husband Owen. And see, encouraged by others to come along. In God's plan, there he's got an Andrew who pushes and says, look, get down to the little chapel down the road. And so, you see, God uses people. God uses ministers, he uses missionaries, but he uses ordinary people. We're to share what great things the Messiah, the Saviour has done for us. He says, come and see the Christ, the Messiah, the Saviour, the Anointed One. They would have understood that. Peter understood what the anointed, the only ones anointed in the Old Testament, and Jews knew this, was the prophets, the priests, and the kings. This one was the Anointed One, the Christ. He was prophet priest and king. Come and see. Come and hear him. This is the one that he encourages him to come. Andrew drags Simon along. It'd be nice if next week suddenly we turned up and you all dragged somebody with you or I dragged somebody with me. That there was others coming along, wouldn't it? So he dragged, not dragged, but encouraged Peter to come. I remember Gaina sitting in the back of the one she, it must have been, I don't know how long she'd been coming, maybe 10 years, I can't remember. She'd been living in the village 20 years. I didn't even know her. And then she was up at Kosh or something. <laughs> I remember sitting on the table with Gaynor and got talking to her. And, and she was saying about her background in Baptist circles. And, and so we got to, I said, well, we're not a lot different down in that little chapel down the road there. And of course she started coming, didn't she? From a little conversation at the table up at Kosh Nosh, has been coming for, for many years. So we never know, do we, who we're speaking to. We should never stop encouraging people to come or to listen to what we've got to say. Verse 42. So Jesus sees Simon coming to him now. And he called him Cephas or, and, and, or Peter and says, Here you are, Peter, Simon Peter, son of Jonah. 
Simon, how, how do you know my name? Because Jesus knows us through and through. He knows everything about us. Andrew's brought him to Jesus. Wasn't it amazing that woman at the well Jesus met? She wasn't, she's what we call a loose woman, I suppose. She'd had a number of men. People disregard her in society. Jesus goes and meets her. And when she comes to faith, I believe, in Christ, what happens? She goes back to the town and she tells the people. A woman goes and gets all these people to come and listen to Jesus. So whether you're men, whether you're women, we've got a role. We're to call people, we're to encourage people, we're to tell people about Jesus. She did it. He's impressed with what Jesus says. He says, Peter, you're going to be called a stone. You're going to be, Ephesians 2 verse 20 tells us, one of the apostles upon whom the church will be built upon these foundations. He would build his church on the confession that Peter was going to make. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What a change grace makes. What a change God makes within a life. The potential that lied in this selfish, impulsive, aggressive man. Jesus changed him. And who knows what, a, what potential lies in those that we offer and encourage to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Who knows what they'll be, how they will be used. So day three, Andrew's taken Peter to, to, to see Jesus. Jesus knew who Peter was before he even came. He said, son of Jonah, I know who you are. Peter was going to be changed drastically. On day four, in verse 43, normally Jesus takes, or someone's taken to Jesus, encouraged, as I've said this morning. And God uses people, but God doesn't have to use people. He can actually just work in his own way. Because the next day, Jesus goes to Galilee. Andrew sought Jesus. Andrew brought Peter. Now Jesus goes, like the lady at the well, and he deals directly with Philip. Doesn't use any intermediary, just Philip. He goes to Philip. He calls him to follow him. He's like when he passes Matthew at the tax collector's table. He says, come and follow me. What does Matthew do? He sits down and no, he doesn't. He puts down his stuff and he's up and he's away. Because Jesus had directly called him. And so God works personally in people's lives in different ways. Perhaps by reading a scripture or coming across something or God convicts us about something. It's, God works in different ways. Philip, he goes and calls directly. No intermediary. He calls him to follow. Goes out of his way to cause ordinary people to follow him. If any man comes after me and will take up his cross and deny himself, he should come and he should follow me, man and woman. Jesus calls different people in different ways. Jesus called me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He came, that good shepherd, and sought those sheep that were lost. Philip, from the same area as Andrew and Peter, it's like living in Kosh and I know the candy boards and all of those because that's, that's the people I grew up amongst. Philip is from the same sort of area, seeks out Nathaniel or Bath Bartholomew. Philip doesn't say, that's wonderful, I found the Savior, I'm all right, Jack, that's okay. He actually tells his mate, Nathaniel, Bartholomew, I found the Messiah, it's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, the carpenter if you want. Who says he's the one promised to fulfill the Old Testament who would come. He's the one the prophets spoke about. He's come. It is the Messiah. Philip would have known and Nathaniel would have known all about what the prophets said. about One would be born of a virgin. One would come from the seed of David. He would have also known that he would have come and he would have been born in Bethlehem. So when Philip says, I found the Messiah. He's come from Nazareth. So what does Nathaniel do as a good Jewish historian, if you want? He says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Jesus said in John 5, verse 39, he said, look, if you read the Bible, you read the Old Testament, they speak about me. All the prophecies are talking about Jesus. 
Nathaniel's got a prejudice against those who live in, in Nazareth. Actually, a joke in the school, a joke in, in, with the teachers sometimes. They actually call Kosh now, Posh Kosh. That's what it's called. So if you, come, if you live in Kosh, Kylie, we're Posh Kosh. So that's what they say. That wasn't the case years ago. In years gone by, it was not known as Posh Kosh. There were some poor families in Kosh, and self included, as I said the other day. We were, there were a number of us very poor, and perhaps you'd say a bit rough and ready, and what have you. But it's changed drastically. If you'd have said before you came from Kosh, they could have named a number of families. Oh, I know so and so in Kosh. Today they'd say, oh, you come from Kosh. Yeah, it's quite a posh place, Kosh. That, now they'd say about, I actually remember now saying when I was in the seminary, I don't know how I said it, I probably put my foot in it. But I remember saying something like, um, um, you know, I was to explain something, I said, it's like, well, you know, Moncton, you know what Moncton's like. And I said, I said uh, two of the LSAs come up to me afterwards and said, uh, we were born in Moncton, Moncton, we're from Moncton. You can take the woman out of Moncton, they said, but you won't take Moncton out of the woman. So I was, they were, did a joke to me about it, thankfully. But can any good thing come out of Nazareth? What he didn't understand was that actually Jesus didn't come from Nazareth. Did he? he grew up in Nazareth, but he actually was born in Bethlehem. So despite his prejudice, and we can be prejudiced against so many people in situation, Jesus knows us through and through. And when Jesus looks at this man, Nathaniel, Bartholomew, whatever you want to call him, he's already made this sort of assessment, this man cannot be the Son of God because the Son of God was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. He's come from Nazareth, from Kosh, from Moncton, we call it. How can he? But you see, Jesus walks in verse 47 towards him and as he approaches, he says, look, now there's a true Jew. What he was doing, he was speaking about Romans chapter 2. And he was saying what Paul was saying. Who is a true Jew? He says, the true Jew is not one who's one outwardly. The true Jew is one who's inwardly come to faith in God. It's not about a nation. It's not about a family pedigree. It's about now if we are sons and daughters of Abraham's faith, if you want. True believers. He says, this man's a true Jew. There's no deceit. There's no hypocrisy. No outward just show of being a believer like many Jews were. He knew who this was. This was the Son of God, and he sees us right through to our hearts. So I can kid you all here, and there's, I mentioned the other week, there's many men at the front have obviously lived double lives. But actually, God knows my heart, and he knows your heart. He knows if we're genuine, if we're a true Jew, true is right or not. He could say, here's a true saint if you want. Here's a true seeker, a true man of God. Nathaniel says, how do you know, verse 8 to 48? I knew you even when you were under the fig tree. I saw you even before we came into contact with each other. I am the sovereign, elected, almighty God who knows his people through and through. And I knew where you were, and I knew I was going to see you. I'm the one who's omniscient, who knows everything there is to know. Before I even set physical eyes on you, I knew who you were. Verse 49, no doubt him. Now can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Can any good thing come out of Cautiston? Well, there have been those good things that have come out of Cautiston. Verse 49, teacher, I realize you are the one who we belong for. You're the promised saviour. You're the king of kings. You are the son of God, as he claimed one chapter 1, verse 14 there. Seeing the testimony and witnessing. See it working as John speaks of how Andrew brings Peter and how Philip takes, tells uh, Nathaniel. So Jesus Christ responds. You acknowledge who I am. You believe in me now because of what I've told you. This is just the beginning. You're going to see great things. Nathaniel knew with the Old Testament in verse 51 there. And Jesus refers to the Jews, and he can refer back to the likes of Esau and the likes of Jacob. And he can refer back to how Jacob saw the angels going up and down on that ladder, on that, on that vision that the deceiver had. He saw something of the glory of God coming to earth. Nathaniel, you're going to see great things in the years ahead. You're going to see some supernatural things taking place because the Son of God has come from his throne in glory 
and he's come down to you. I did a thing with the kids all a couple of years ago in school. I do these little PowerPoints. Derek Redman, I think I've mentioned it before. Derek Redman was a 400 meter runner. He was in the, in the Olympic semi-final. And he's in the semi-final and he's coming around and his hamstring went. Have you ever your hamstrings gone? I never knew what a hamstring was when I was playing. I used to think, what's this ping in the back of my, my leg? And, but the, the, if your hamstring goes, you, you can't do anything. She's running down the home straight and his hamstring goes, ping is gone. So it's the semi-final of, of the Olympics. The people come over, he, he wants to get to the line, so he hobbles on. People come alongside him, they try. He's pushing them all away and he wants to finish the race. And then this bloke jumps out of the stand. He comes down under the track, he puts his arm around him, and he carries him more or less all the way to the line. It was his father. His father jumped out, got hold of him, and carried him through. He'd left the stand to come and to bring his son home past the finishing line. And what a wonderful illustration of what Jesus Christ has done. He's left the glory, he's left the stand. He's come into this world to bring us safely home. If we seek him, we'll find him. If we found him, we need to follow him. If we follow him, we need to get others alongside to follow him. How will we hear? How will they hear without a preacher? Who else can we follow? Who else are we going to turn to? Well, Jesus says, or they say to Jesus, Peter says to Jesus, in John chapter 6 and verse 68 and 69, Jesus says to them, do you also want to go away? Now this is Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered, did I not choose you and the twelve? Did I not know who you were and I put my hand upon you? Where else can we go? Where else are you going to find meaning? Your heart goes out to that, that, um, that cyclist hoy. You think, well, what do you hang on to in the last months of your life? You've got no eternal hope. There is one who's come from the stands and wants to bring us past the finishing line. We ought to be those who are called to follow him, to come and follow him. Thankfully, we're all different here this morning. We've got different backgrounds, different intellect. Actually, he calls ordinary people normally. But we also need to encourage others to come and to join with us. Let's close and sing our final hymn. And our final hymn is More about Jesus what I know And more of his grace to others show More of his saving fullness see And more of his love who died for me